And there we go. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to those of you who are able to join us live. Uh, I am Professor Steve Sloda at the University of Connecticut, and I'm going to share with you a presentation that I jokingly called uh, this morning something witty about stories, why stories are storyrific and everyone should tell them, but have since decided to have an actual name. So this is an official event. And I've decided to focus on fixed versus emergent narrative. So affordances of different kinds of approaches to interactive storytelling. And sort of when I thought about how I was going to start this talk or what I wanted to actually talk about, um, I went back to what am I doing right now? Like, what are the things I'm focused on? What are the games I'm playing? What are the things I'm reading? What are I most interested in? And to give you a little bit of a background on who I am and what I do, at UConn, I have a sort of unique role as an assistant professor in residence of educational technology. I sit between the Department of Educational Psychology and the NEAG School of Education. And my other part of my job is for the School of Fine Arts in the Department of Digital Media Design. So I co-administrate the ed tech program, the master's program, and, and assist with doctoral students in that capacity. And then wearing this other hat, I work with Ken Thompson to do game design stuff. And that's sort of born of a history of doing a bunch of different things. So I used to think when I was growing up, there's one neat path to getting to whatever it is you want to do. And it turns out that's not actually the case, at least not now. And I've done a couple different kinds of things as I've gone through my early career. I started out, I graduated from UConn um, in 2007 with a bachelor's of science in molecular and cell bio. I didn't know what I wanted to do and ultimately decided to become a teacher. So I enrolled in the teacher certification program for college graduates through the NEAG school and ultimately became a science teacher. I did that for a few years and simultaneously worked as a district technology specialist. So that meant I was running professional development seminars and workshops and helping other people learn how to use technology in their classrooms. And then around 2010, my roommate at the time found an article in the uh, Yukon Today magazine or The Advance, whatever it was called at the time. And it was about two of my former faculty when I was an undergrad, Michael Young and Roger Travis, professors Michael Young and Roger Travis, who were working on a project called the Video Games and Human Values Initiative. So I was super interested in that. I had been thinking about going back to grad school and I said, okay, this seems like the thing I should work on. I wanna focus on games and education. Those are two things I'm really passionate about. And I was sort of motivated by the fact that I really cared about science and wanted people to understand science and be passionate about it like I was. So I left my job teaching high school science to go uh, back to school at UConn and get my PhD. Uh, that took me about four years to do. And I did two dissertations, one of which did not go terribly well, and the other one ended up being OK. Um, and then around the same time, I co-founded an educational design company called the Pericles Group. So. Just for clarity's sake, I should say that I, I am a co-founder and owner of the Pericles Group, which is a small indie game design company or publishing company. And we make games that are intended to teach specific kinds of content. So uh, in, the, in the case of Operation Lapis and Werba, uh, it's, it's language content. And in the case of Underlings of Underwing, which is a game featuring dragons and colored gems, that's all about color theory. So, uh, and when we dabble in some other projects as well, so it's not just those things, but also the um, the more expansive goal of publishing well-developed learning science oriented and um, instructionally useful games. After I finished my uh, dissertation and I uh, got a job down in Tempe, Arizona, working at Arizona State University's Center for Games and Impact. So I worked with Sasha Barab and a few other people who are sort of names in the serious game space. And when I uh, finished my stint down there, I came back up to Connecticut, worked at Yukon Health Center as an instructional design specialist, and then ultimately migrated to the Storrs campus of Yukon in 2017 to do my current job, which is as a learning scientist and instructional game designer. So these are some pictures of games I've worked on, advised on, consulted on. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about all of them, but most of them you'll probably notice are analog in nature. They are not video games or virtual reality. 
And even though many of the projects... Oh, jeez. Okay. Are you able to see with it uh, set up this way? Okay. That's okay. Um, so... We... Cool. Um, for the time being, I'll just use the slides as they are this way. So um, anyway, all you missed was just a slide with my face on it, which you can see my face and you don't need to worry about that. And then this other slide that had uh, sort of my career background, the things that I do at UConn. So this is the slide I was just on talking a little bit about the projects I've worked on. Um, there are a variety of them and I won't go into a great deal of detail, but you'll notice that most of them are analog or board games. Uh, text-based games, things that are not strictly video games. And that's because at the time that I sort of got into doing game design, indie game development was uh, relatively uh, up and coming. There were a lot more people trying to build their own games. There's a, a company out of Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, called um, The Game Crafter. And they were able to publish sort of one-off titles that people had developed for themselves. So they, they're a print shop and would essentially be able to print you one copy of a game if you needed it instead of having to get these large orders of 500 or 1,000 copies, which are very expensive. So there were a lot of people starting to do analog board game, card game design. Settlers of Catan was still very popular. The uh, pandemic, I think, was a, uh, out around that time. So there were starting to be these different kinds of analog games that were demonstrating the effectiveness of board games, card games, and story games for getting people to understand stuff. And in the early 2010s, there was sort of this reorientation of ed tech people toward playful learning spaces. And the, the Games Learning Society Conference, where I met where many of my colleagues, um, it was sort of oriented towards getting design folks, people who worked in industry, to coordinate with people who were working in education and research, as well as K through 12 teachers or people who would actually be implementing games like this in their classrooms. So there was sort of this nice nexus of people and opportunity and resources available to do these kinds of things. And I found my niche doing this kind of thing as opposed to, and when I say this kind of thing, I mean analog and board game and text-based games, uh, as opposed to video games, which were still prohibitively expensive. It was just very difficult to create a game. and. My colleagues, uh, Kevin Balestrini and Roger Travis, with whom I founded the Pericles Group, um, they're classicists. I am not a classicist. I don't know much about Latin. Um, I know some about Roman culture, but I'm by no means an expert. And really what we found in working together is there isn't a huge market for selling Latin education video games. And it turns out that as cool an idea as creating an MMO about ancient Rome or Pompeii would be, it's really, really expensive to make an MMO that many people can participate in that is designed in the target language and creates these sort of authentic experiences. So we ended up taking a step back and saying, what is something relatively inexpensive or low to moderate cost or investment to get to the learning objective we actually have, which is for people to take on a particular perspective or role and then act on that role to better understand how to do it in the real world. So for instance, if I want somebody to understand how to be a scientist, I'm going to make a game in which they have to play the role of a scientist. And then the mechanics of the game are actually the same thing as learning all the tasks and activities that a scientist does. And then getting them to reflect on that experience in order to get them to transfer the ideas of doing science from that context in the game to one that's outside the context of the game, whatever the environment may be. So that brings me to kind of the point of this talk and what I'd like to discuss with all of you. And this might be a good time to mention as well, if you have questions or thoughts or ideas as I'm going, please feel free to interject and jump in on your own microphone. Um, I'm happy to entertain whatever it is that comes to mind. But my goal is going to be talking to you a little bit about where my current thoughts are on narrative. And when I say narrative, what does that mean? Well, that's, that's a really difficult thing to answer, but for myself, I think about narrative in the context of games or interactive activities. So my colleague, Dr. Young and I, and I should say also Dr. Young was my former advisor. So when I got my PhD, he was also my advisor. And so we've been studying these things together for about 10 years now. Uh, back in 2014, we wrote together that games are organized, goal-driven opportunities for agent environment interaction in which individuals are directed toward playfulness. 
And I want to emphasize the word interaction. And in addition to that, I'd like you to think about what agent environment interaction means. Um, does anyone have a guess as to what that actually refers to? What is it? I mean, it's a lot of words, a lot of syllables in there, agent environment interaction. What do you think that means if you're somebody who's designing games or stories? Um, I would say that if the elements of a game are the game itself and the player, I would assume that agent environment interaction is the player interacting with the game as an environment and then receiving feedback from the actions that they take from that environment and then kind of determining their next action based on that. That's That, that would be my guess. That is a good guess. I'm going to yes and oh. your guess and say it is that, but it is also the environment outside the context of the game and still surrounding the player or the full context of who the player is in addition to the game environment. So there's sort of the, the interaction between myself and the device on which I am playing this game. There's the relationship between the device and the environment around me. Uh, for instance, the space in which I am uh, setting up this device or playing on this device. And there's also the relationship between myself and that in surrounding environment. So to take this uh, a step further, imagine that you're sitting at the computer playing Diablo and it's not just about you as the individual player playing Diablo. It's also about how you're able to physically interact with that keyboard and that device to be able to move your character around the screen and interact with the things you want to interact with. It's also about the surrounding environment outside of the context of the computer. So if it's very noisy, if the cat is biting my leg, if there are people who are trying to get my attention, all of those things are going to distract from the goals that I have oriented in the context of the game. So uh, when we're thinking about players and the games that we develop or the stories that we're telling, it's not really just about the player and the story or the player and the game. It's about the player and everything else that makes that player who they are and the context in which they are operating. It's all some, uh, what we call uh, situated. It's a situated perspective of how people interact with games. Um, and so there are a couple of reasons why I think it's valuable to think about this. It's not just sort of armchair philosophy where you sit back and wonder about the world, although I do enjoy that as well. Um, the reason why I think it's useful and valuable for you to understand this stuff is because narrative and play emerge in all kinds of spaces. It's not just in a video game. It's not just in the context of a board game. It's not even just in the context of games. This is true all over uh, every aspect of our lives, whether it's religious practices or how you engage civically with your community or how you talk to people in your family. You are always performing a role and the way that you play that role is going to have different effects on the environment or consequences for yourself as the individual. So I want you to think about as we're going through some of these concepts, how and why people tell stories. Uh, what is the purpose of storytelling in everyday life or design? Why do we do that? I'm going to explain to you three levels of narrative and how they influence the way that we spread ideas. I'm going to talk about engagement a little bit. And specifically, I'm going to focus on fixed versus emergent narrative, which is sort of the terminology I've been using to describe different kinds of games that one might play, different story structures for games one might play. And I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about the practical applications of some of these things. So if you've heard me talk about stories and narrative design and games before, some of this will be familiar. Some of it is going to be new in the sense that I'm building off of the concepts that you've probably heard about before. So uh, I, I would say that there's some a little bit of a barrier to entry, uh, but if you're a little bit familiar with games and a little bit familiar with stories, there should be something in here for everybody. Um, I'll just kind of, I've gotten, every time I've given a presentation like this, I've gotten faster and faster and faster at kind of getting to the point about what stories and games are. And so I still have this slide in here that I've been using for, I think, nine years. And uh, the whole point of this slide is just to illustrate that humans are storytellers. They tell stories to each other for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's for entertainment. Sometimes it's because there's an urgent matter that needs to be dealt with. Sometimes it's because uh, that's the best way to communicate particular information that's going to help the community itself survive. So for instance, it was important in ancient times for people to be able to communicate what the images were in the stars so that other people could use that information to themselves navigate on land or by sea and then uh, successfully uh, move about the world and find sustenance and have safe places to exist. And so that is sort of the, the 
crux of everything that we now do in, in the context of storytelling and games and education is thinking about the application of these skills that humans are sort of just naturally good at, right? Story structures, beginning, middle, and end, um, grammar structures, where you're able to organize sentences in ways that we can communicate to one another and that makes sense. All of these things are sort of baked into our history. They're baked into antiquity. They are still important today and they will continue to be important in the future. Um, and again, that's sort of my abbreviated explanation of how cultures have adapted stories over time. It's obviously a very complex thing, uh, historically speaking, culturally speaking. But for all intents and purposes, this is something that's common across all humans. We all tell stories, we all find value in them, and we're all able to apply them towards solving problems in the real world. Um, I'm not the only person to have talked about things like this. Uh, many of my predecessors, as well as colleagues, have written about similar topics. That includes James Paul G., who's sort of the grandfather of games and education. Uh, he is a linguist who specifically got interested in games when his own son was starting to play video games as a child. And so he started to write about what video games did that literacy also did and started to look at how the similarities and differences be, uh, between games could be useful for teaching and learning. Uh, there's also Reality is Broken, Jane McGonigal's pretty famous book. Um, and then following from that, some more research-oriented studies, including one on which I am a co-author, the, uh, the paper, Our Princesses in Another Castle, uh, a review of trends in serious gaming for education, and also the more recent version and consolidation of some of these texts, uh, Exploding the Castle, Rethinking How Video Games and Game Mechanics Can Shape the Future of Education. And that's from 2017. So the things I'm going to talk about today are basically the next step beyond that. What is on the cutting edge of design for narrative and education as we understand it, as situated cognitivists, as people working at the University of Connecticut? Now, I don't wanna do a ton of uh, semantic uh, debate about what these different things are. For all intents and purposes, I'm going to pretend that these are all the same thing. And when I talk about serious games or instructional games, that means game-based learning, it means playful learning, it means gamification, which I think of as a subset of instructional game design, specifically oriented towards behavioral uh, reinforcement, operant conditioning. But I'm gonna talk about narrative in the context of instructional game design, which means how you can create games to teach a thing. And that may sound like it's about school, but it's about school as well as other things. And I would include industry in entertainment game design in that category as well, that when game designers make games, they're trying to teach a specific thing or talk about a specific idea. And the player community that sort of bubbles up around that game is going to share that idea. And they're going to talk about it, debate it. They're going to figure out what parts of it do they keep? What ones do they reject? Do they make their own fan fiction based off of that? So all of that is sort of encompassed in instructional game design for me. It's, it's not just about schools and their applications of games. It's also about this other stuff that happens surrounding games in the metagame environment. And it's also important to remember that games are just themselves stories. They are built around story worlds. That means that there is sort of a robust explanation for how this universe came into being, what its inhabitants are like, how they behave. Um, and the games are just interactive narratives set in those story worlds. So you are participating in a given story world uh, as an individual in that story world. Sometimes you get to choose who that individual is. Sometimes you do not. That's actually kind of going to be the crux of this talk. Uh, and it's important that designers think about this when they're in the process of developing a game, not just in the context of quote unquote, air quote, uh, writing the story, but in the context of what are we actually doing this for? What's the purpose of our design? What experience do we want the player to have and why do we want them to have it? So you probably think about narrative in these terms or similar terms, sort of the elements of narrative, character, plot, setting, style, theme, that sort of thing. So if you were to write a book report when you were in school, you might talk about some of these concepts. Um, but I, I think that's just part of the story, right? It's it's not really, that pun unintended, um, it's part of the way that we think about organizing information. It's part of the way that we think about how we communicate uh, ideas to other people. But again, it's only part. And I'm, I'm going to sort of fixate on that last one theme for a second there. Um, because when you are authoring anything, 
there is inherently going to be some sort of bias or theme baked into the work that you do. So I wanted to mention authorial intent versus the author is dead. And again, like this isn't a threat. I'm not threatening any authors. It's, it's all good. Uh, the, the whole point of this is to illustrate that when you are writing or producing or designing something, all of your experiences, again, sort of that Diablo example where you're the person in the room as well as the person interacting with the computer in the game, as well as the person who's interacting with the space outside of the context of that single room and game, um, all of that is going to feed into how you tell or design your story. So your authorial intent doesn't have to be intentional in the sense that you know or knowingly aware of what you are doing, but that your experiences are inherently going to affect and in, 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 in sort of uh, dictate the kind of story that you're able to tell. And I'll point to J.R.R. Tolkien just as one example of that, where Tolkien was very adamant that his writing of Lord of the Rings was not an allegory of any particular event or uh, belief system. But if you were to analyze the actual written work of Lord of the Rings in the context of when it was written, whom it was written by, what things influenced the author's life, it's very clear that there are uh, religious and um, personal stories baked into the context of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, that doesn't mean that the audience can't get something else out of that text that was not there from the author's perspective. Uh, so I could, as a reader of The Lord of the Rings, take away something from that experience that the author, Tolkien, did not intend, did not write in there, had no real belief about himself. Um, and I can make meaning of my own life in the context of the work that he created in the context of his own life. So that brings me to this concept uh, called a life world. This is published in 2006 uh, by some of my colleagues, uh, again, Sasha Barab, who I mentioned earlier. Um, but they define a life world as the environment for an individual described in terms of the customary ways of structuring the activities that take place within it. So uh, it contains objects and social and material phenomena that are salient to the acting individual. That Again, that's the agent, the person who's acting in response to the environment. And it focuses on their goals and intentions. It's thinking about how that individual exists in that particular space with their particular sets of background experiences and intentions for action on the world. So two people could be in the same physical space. We could occupy the same room, but we're going to be occupying two very different life worlds, even if we're in that room. And I would argue that even in the context of that physical room, you're never going to be able to occupy the same exact physical space as another human being. It's just not possible. So perspective is always going to be dependent on who you are and the space time in which you exist. Um, I mentioned earlier this term situated or situated cognition. Situated cognition is a branch of educational philosophy or learning theory that focuses on the epistemology of rationalism or how we know stuff. And it's sort of built on empiricism, which is the Enlightenment era scientific method sort of approach where you falsify the environment to make sense of it and you use that information to inform your understanding of reality. So in a situated perspective or under a situated cognition perspective, individuals perceive and act on the environment based on all sorts of things that define their life world. That includes their genetic predisposition, it includes their physical effectivities or their senses. And by senses, I don't just mean like the five senses you all hear about in elementary school, but additional ones like your sense of balance, your sense of proprioception, haptic feedback, other forms of information that your body is able to interpret and then act upon. And then also prior experience. So everything that has happened up in your life until this very moment uh, is going to then determine what happens in the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. So all of these things interact as a complex system that defines who you are as an agent interacting with the environment. That's a lot of of things to think about, right? But if I had to boil that down to one sentence or paragraph, it would probably be this one, which I, I wrote a few years ago in conjunction with my colleague, Kevin Balestrini, in the context of writing about anchored instruction or how you can put stories and games into classrooms to help get students to engage and think differently about their own uh, behavior. Uh, in this writing, we, we put together um, Following, humans are unique collections of information with unique understandings, understandings of the environment based on unique genes running through unique sets of lived experiences. No two individuals can live the same life or have the same thoughts or engage in the same interactions with their peers. 
even experiences we return to at a later time in the same location with the same people doing the same thing are shaped and reshaped by the in-between periods during which we explore new ideas and engage in critical reflection. We are biological storybooks with pages printed upon by the external world, continuous narratives that tie together existence across the space time we occupy. Each one of us is one life, una vida, through which questions are asked and ideas are explored to define who we are, where we belong, and what story we will ultimately leave behind. So what's the point? That's sort of philosophical, right? Like what, if we're talking about stories and a legacy and what does all of this mean for education? Well, it comes down to how we organize ourselves as humans in relation to stories, how stories are sort of a uh, scaffolding for our making sense of ourselves. And in my dissertation back in 2014, I proposed that, that there were three levels of narrative you so, could sort of analyze to understand how individuals interact with different kinds of stories and identify potential affordances of those story frameworks for getting people to understand something they might not previously have understood. So the first level was narrative as designed, essentially the authorial intent, or I'm the designer, I'm the author, I wanna create a particular experience to communicate a particular message to my audience in the context of something like Bioshock, there's a very specific authorial intent that the designers went in with when they created that game. They knew that they wanted to create a particular experience and they built the entire game and the narrative accompanying it around that one moment of experience towards the late part of the game. Um, this is all, if yeah, I could just ahead. jump in, um, I think one thing that narrative as designed is super interesting, um, like how the matrix is really an allegory for like transgenderism, right? Um, as kind of the two writer directors have uh, framed it and like them talked about it. Um, I think it's very interesting that the term red pill, which is used so widely um, across like a very specific, it's used very specifically by a very specific crowd, but in reality, they don't actually understand what it's allegorical for, right? I think that I think that's a very good example of what authorial intent and like the result of a produced narrative can act. Like I think that's just a really good example of people not of people taking a narrative and then kind of spinning it for their own purposes. I'm so glad you said that because it's actually a perfect segue into the next component of what I wanted to talk about. And the Wachowskis with the Matrix trilogy is a really good example of how the second level and the third level sort of interact with one another. So to sort of recap, there's the authorial intent perspective, that first level of narrative. There's the second level of narrative in which the audience understands the uh, piece of, of art, the design that you've created a particular way. So Individuals within that audience are going to interpret your work based or the author's work based on their own individual life worlds. The author has no control over that. So when you design a particular piece of art or a particular game or a particular story, the people reading that story are going to interpret and act on that story based on their own situated understanding of reality. So um, I, I previously used the example of uh, if you were to read a story that was about a, a knight going to save the... Uh, the, the, the fair maiden or lord or whoever's in the tower, um, you could interpret that story many different ways depending on the context in which you're reading it. So if you're misanthropic and you're really opposed to love stories, that's going to read very differently than if you're somebody who's optimistic and understands the story as one about heroism and courage. Um, and, and so the reason why I like to mention this is because it's very easy to get caught in this trap of arguing about what the author intended. And, and I would argue it doesn't really matter what the author intended at the end of the day. It comes down to the interaction between the author and their work and then the audience in that work. And the author can issue a missive about what they think their story is about, or, you know, um, an authorial statement, a, an artist statement that accompanies the work, but they cannot control how the audience perceives or acts upon that information. So, that brings me to this third level. Apologies for the little uh, graphical error with the slide. Um, the third level of narrative is social organizer. So this is how communities of practice emerge around a given authored work. Uh, going back to the example of Tolkien, Tolkien wrote The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. 
audiences were able to project onto that work, whatever their particular interpretation was and apply it in their own lives as they saw fit. And that community itself socially organized around the Lord of the Rings as a work or Middle Earth as a work and continues to this day to propagate memes about Lord of the Rings or share jokes about Lord of the Rings. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard or thought about they're taking the hobbits to Isengard. And none of that is Tolkien, right? Like Tolkien didn't do any of those things, but the community that emerged around Tolkien's work ultimately it can take its own direction. It can decide what it wants to do and break off into all these peripheral groups. So it's really important to understand when you're talking about story that there are these different levels at which it operates and that there is no singular perspective that is correct when it comes to understanding a work, even in the context of the author's beliefs about their own work, because the author can revisit their work later and change their mind. So a particular story is always going to be emblematic of the thing as it was created at that moment in time by that individual within that context with that particular audience. So just as a quick example, I'm not going to linger too long on this, but uh, narrative is designed. I use the example of Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand was a very not good individual who no one should read her work seriously. But one of the reasons she's a useful exemplar is because she was very, very clear about what her authorial intent was. And so um, she argued that happiness is selfishness, that essentially the best thing a person could do would be to act in their own personal interests and to hell with everybody else. Um, now, that can be interpreted multiple ways, depending on who you are as an individual and what your life world is. So I like to contrast these two quotes. One of them is by former United States House Speaker Paul Ryan, who uh, said that Ayn Rand more than anyone else did a fantastic job of explaining the morality of capitalism, the morality of individualism, and this to me is what matters most, versus uh, writer John Rogers, who around the same time had to say, there are two novels that can change a bookish 14-year-old's life, The Lord of the Rings and Atlas Shrugged. One is a childish fantasy that often engenders a lifelong obsession with its unbelievable heroes, leading to an emotionally stunted, socially crippled adulthood, unable to deal with the real world. The other, of course, involves orcs. And again, one of the reasons why I find this to be such a useful example is because, A, Ayn Rand said very specifically what her perspective was or what objectivism was all about. B, there's... Uh, different perspectives that we can point to in the real world as lived examples of what happens when different kinds of people interpret a work differently. And then see this last piece, which is about how the community then organizes around that text. And so the Simpsons and Bioshock, which both satirize Ayn Rand's work in different ways, um, have something to say about it, right? That it, her work ultimately begets other work that has something important to say. So um, my argument to you as you're thinking about stories that you design or author is to consider all the different perspectives or levels at which that story is going to be interpreted and uh, reinterpreted and republished in different formats uh, under different ideologies by different kinds of people. Um, and this brings me back to sort of why do I care about this or why do I think it's important, um, particularly for people who are like game designers. Like if you're going to code for a company or you're going to be a, a systems designer, do you really need to understand this stuff? And I would I would suggest yes, you do. And the primary reason why is another quote that comes from um, the, the Una Vida chapter I wrote with Kevin Balestrini. Our students fundamentally can't bring the same experiences to their learning that we once did to ours, nor can we comprehend what it is to be in each of their seats. So much of their long-term success in both career and life is going to depend on their ability to critically reflect. And that makes us as teachers responsible for these four things. Facilitating student exposure to multiple points of view by two seeking and leveraging opportunities to figuratively put students in another person's position, while three, recognizing the strengths, weaknesses, and relative background experiences of each learner, and four, maintaining fidelity to the psychological, emotional, and cultural constructs associated with the content and skills to be taught. Now, I realize this says the words students and teaching and taught, and this is written as though it's applied for teachers in a classroom context, and yes, that's true, but you also, as game designers, are teachers. You are designing experiences that individuals will interact with, that they will have an opinion about, that they will then organize communities around. And so 
the authorial intent, as much as it doesn't matter in the context of the death of the author and the second level of narrative during which the individual audience members will interpret your work however they want, it does matter and is important in the context of you understanding the power of your voice, that when you publish something, you are a teacher and that you are teaching an audience a thing. Um, there are a number of examples of game designers who did not take this into account and inadvertently end up endorsing perspectives that they probably don't want to endorse or you hope that they don't want to endorse. There's also instances of game designers sort of just neglecting the power of their voice and missing an opportunity to do good in the world. And there's there are a variety of reasons for that that are complicated and deeply dependent on the incentive structures that different kinds of people operate on. So for instance, there is no incentive for Call of Duty to actually teach the accurate history of the Holocaust and have people become sensitive to the plight of the Jewish people um, because that's not something that's gonna sell a lot of games. It's gonna create a lot of controversy and be really difficult. It's way easier to make the game about just shooting Nazis and um, you lose all the nuance in that, but it broadens the aperture for your audience so that you can get more people to buy your game. And so, uh, my perspective is that if you are creating games, you don't want to be the person creating Call of Duty because you can do so much more than that. And the platform you have and the perspective you can offer can be so much richer than that. So um, there are a couple ways to do this. And again, I'm going to come back to sort of the practical application of this towards the end. But I wanted to at least uh, make you aware of these ideas that uh, for one thing, you can leverage generator sets to tune intention and attention toward invariant elements across contexts. So what does that mean? That's a lot of complicated words. Um, generator sets are essentially stories. And the idea is that you want to give people multiple stories that they can compare against one another to identify variants or invariants. That's to identify the things that are similar or different between them so that in the future, when they encounter novel problems, they can apply some of those lessons and transfer what they learned from those earlier stories or contexts. You might have done this already in many of your other classes or in other uh, environments at work, et cetera, where you do case studies or you examine case studies to look at what went wrong or what went well or why did this work or look at these two cases, how, what's similar and different about them. That's exactly the kind of thing you can do in the context of design with respect to getting people to understand the theme uh, or your authorial intent. You can also foster the audience's general investigatory skills so you can get them to ask questions about things. Getting people to engage in inquiry is often very effective for engagement purposes. It's also really helpful for getting them to think critically about a particular idea. And then uh, the last one there is sort of tilted towards education, but still relevant in the context of how you structure evaluation in a game. So in a game environment, for instance, players get points, they get rewarded with narrative, they get rewarded with uh, cool outfits. All of those different things have to be measured in some way. And so you have to think about what are the different kinds of levels of measurement that we can do and how do we assess those things? Um, in this case, I, I recommend a combination of distal measurements. So sort of low stakes things that are hands-on that somebody can experiment with and then higher stakes, uh, proximal measurements that are sort of external or removed from that hands-on experience. Um, that is important. And I, this diagram is probably pretty weird looking. and uh, if you've never seen anything like it before, uh, this is called the intentional spring. And it's sort of a thought model for how you can get somebody to adopt a belief structure or a set of intentions to do a particular thing. So in the model, there are two individuals. One of them is on either side of a wooden wall, or let's call it a wall. And on one side of the wall, one of these individuals is holding on to a metal bar that's in between the wall, and it's connected to a spring. Now, the idea is that this bar, because it sticks through the wall, there's, there's a sort of a, uh, an opening there where it can slide back and forth in accordance with how far the spring is pulled back. And there's a certain mark on the wall that we want to get this person to pull the bar to. Now, on the other side of the wall, where you can't see the spring, you can't interact with it, there's somebody who's blindfolded, they have their ears plugged, they don't know anything about the world other than that this bar exists and that it moves laterally through the wall. They can't see the person on the other side. They don't know that this is how the entire apparatus works. And their entire purpose in this thought experiment is to move that bar to the notch in the wall that's marked on the other side by the other person. And what's going to happen is over time, if the person who knows the spring is there starts to pull this thing towards the notch, every time they get there or get close, 
they're going to wait for the person on the other side to nudge it closer. And over time, what's going to happen is you're going to get one system, the, the left half of this diagram, to teach the other half of this system, the right half of the di diagram, how to get the bar moved to the correct place or to the shared goal without ever having said a word or shown them anything, just by virtue of them experiencing the movement of this bar through the wall over time and them starting to co act to move in accordance with one another until both sides of the diagram, both individuals participating in this, understand how to move the bar to the right spot. Now, that's a thought experiment. That's not a real thing that we do in the world. We don't put people in a box and then force them to move a bar through the wall. But if you're a game designer, you're the person with the spring. You're the person on the left half of the diagram. You're the person who's trying to nudge the other person's behavior until they know where to move that bar in the wall to meet the notch. They're, they're the one whom you're trying to teach by virtue of the scaffolding you do as a designer, and that includes the way you tell your story, uh, to get the other person to understand the idea and then being able to apply it on their own apart from you. This is something that we kind of call a time for telling. Uh, a time for telling is the point at which a learner notices distinctions between contrasting cases and is then prepared to be told about them. So I realize this doesn't really make sense in the context of me doing like didactic teaching. Like I am talking at all of you right now, but um, in an ideal world, we would be in the same environment doing a hands-on experience, contrasting cases, and then I would be telling you all of these things so that you could apply the ideas or the principles in your own way based on the experiences you had just had with the contrasting cases. So if you're a game designer, often one of the things you wanna do is think about how do I create a time for telling for the player or the audience? If I'm a storyteller, I'm thinking about how do I create a time for telling for the audience member, uh, the person reading my story, so that they are prepared for the idea that I wanted to prepare them for. You can think of that as sort of like foreshadowing is for that purpose. Um, leaving clues in the text is for that purpose. But your idea, the, the goal is to ultimately get the audience member to be able to engage with the work in the way you intended so that they take away something pro-social as opposed to anti-social from the thing that you've created. Which brings me to this. This was sort of the thing I wanted to talk about and felt like all that other stuff was sort of pretext to get you prepared for this moment. Uh, but lately, I've been thinking a lot about fixed versus emergent storytelling and what the affordances of those two kinds of storytelling are for different kinds of designers operating in different contexts. So I wrote down some definitions. I would say, like, don't quote me on this, but like, do quote me if you ever talk to somebody about this. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to put into words how I've been thinking about these things. So these are not official. Like, I haven't published these anywhere. They're just sort of my... Uh, brainstormed, they're the results of my brainstorming about some of these things and conversations with some of the colleagues that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Travis, uh, Dr. Trent Hergenrader uh, up at RIT. Um, I talked to them a lot about some of these things and I've been trying to figure out what I, what I believe about them and how that's useful to teachers and designers when I'm working with them in the future. So I, I, I look at this as sort of a dichotomy. There are two ways that you can develop an interactive experience. And it's not to say that you are one or the other. I think this is actually a spectrum and that there are ways you can be on different parts of the spectrum um, and that it's relative as well. Like you have to think about other games or other in interactive designs in the context of your own to make this sort of distinction. But a fixed experience or for me, a fixed narrative is a highly defined narrative that happens on a rail system. So the audience or the player has agency with respect to the superficial, excuse me, superficial elements of the experience like movement or combat, moving from point A to point B, doing thing A before doing thing B. But there is no way that you can meaningfully deviate from the narrative as designed or that first level, level of narrative beyond turning off the game and walking away from it. So essentially, it is an interactive film. It is a movie that was created by a studio that you then participate in the creation of. It cannot exist apart from you. you it is interactive, but the narrative itself is fixed. So um, I'm going to give you some examples of these things in a second, but marinate on that for a second. Think about your experience with games or interactive experiences and whether that maps to some of them more than others. The other term that I want to introduce is emergent or emergent narrative, emergent storytelling. And emergent story experiences are those in which the audience is afforded the opportunity to invent the narrative for themselves. So complex systems exist in the space. It is an interactive 
experience. You are doing things. Uh, you are interacting with systems. But the dynamic events are not because are not the result of something that's scripted. There's no preconceived narrative necessarily associated with this. It is you as the audience member interacting with this media in order to tell a story based on your experience. So this is operating almost entirely at narrative level two, uh, and to some extent narrative level three as well, that you're thinking about the interaction in terms of your own life experiences and how you make the most sense of that interaction. It's not about authorial intent. In fact, there are many instances in which there is no authorial intent. You are making the meaning or projecting the meaning onto that story all by yourself. So again, I'm gonna show you a, a diagram here and you know, don't at me uh, as the kids say about uh, the, the, the things that I've put on here and the order in which I've put them. That's a joke, by the way, I know how stupid that sounds. Um, I, I, I don't don't worry too much about the order of these things. Again, it is not an official diagram that's meant to prove some scientific point. It is my thoughts about how I organize some of these ideas for myself. And I, depending on the day and what time of day you ask me about and what I'm thinking about, I would probably move some of these things around myself. So uh, I, I created a spectrum of well-defined or fixed narrative to ill-defined or emergent narrative and tried to put some things on the spectrum that I thought represented either end and some of the stuff in between. And I did try to keep the gradient consistent so that it goes from more well-defined to less well-defined or more fixed narrative to more emergent narrative. And you'll notice there on either end of the spectrum, on one end with the fixed emergent, uh, sorry, with the fixed narrative, the well-defined narrative, I put The Last of Us and Bioshock games that have a very specific authorial intent associated with them. It's again, this is not about, is it a good game, quote unquote, air quotes, uh, or bad game, quote unquote, air quotes, but does this adhere to a very specific designed narrative that is more movie-like or more uh, traditionally oriented than something that is interactive and gives maximum agency to the participant or the audience member? So um, Bioshock, again, it is a very, very well-defined narrative. It has a specific plot point that it is intended to uh, intentionally trying to get the player to experience. The Last of Us, the, the first one, I would argue, is very much the same way. There is a particular plot point towards the end of the game that is designed by the designers and cannot be avoided as long as you are playing that game. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, I have put Legos because Legos are sort of the ultimate in emergent storytelling experiences. They are ultimately ill-defined. They are, there is no narrative associated with Legos. You can talk about the Lego movie and like the transmedia story world that's sort of built up around Legos, but at, they are, at their core, Legos are about building whatever you want to build. And um, to me, that sort of represents the, the essence of emergence narrative that whatever I want to build is going to be about the story I'm telling as the, as the participant, the player, the person that's interacting with the media. So I, I would also put Minecraft in this category, maybe slightly above Legos in the sense that you could go after the under dragon. There is some minimal version of a narrative in there, but ultimately you're building whatever you want. The story is really about whatever it is you want to do in that space. And then sort of in between those two things, I've listed a bunch of games that I think fall roughly in those positions. Um, I've been playing a lot of Valheim and Stardew Valley recently, which strike me as being more on the emergent end, specifically Valheim, which again, has no real narrative to speak of, but there are multiple systems designed into the game through which these sort of dynamic experiences emerge. And so my play of Valheim, the stories I have about Valheim, the narrative I tell about Valheim is vastly different than that of somebody else who I don't know who has very different life world experiences playing the same game. Because the things that we're going to apply meaning to in that context will just inherently be different from one another. Um, there are some shared narratives. So I can play Valheim with my friends, as I often have done. And we have our own narratives within the context of the story world. So we have Treskborg, the Swamp Fortress. We have a Boar Blood Tower that was named such because there were a bunch of boars that we had to kill in order to clear out the tower and fix it. And then a troll came and knocked it down. And all of those things are valid narratives. They are shared experiences that we had with interna interactive text, but it's not the same thing as something like The Last of Us or Bioshock, where there is a specific narrative being told. I put Breath of the Wild closer to the fixed end of the spectrum as well, because even though it is not a truly fixed narrative, you can play through the game in whatever order you want, doing whichever quests you want. This is also true of Skyrim, Fallout, um, Divinity. 
uh, you can play the game with those intentions to, to, to do different stuff or explore this over, sort of open world space. But ultimately, there is an underpinning narrative that holds the whole thing together. Like, there is a Legend of Zelda. There are multiple games in the transmedia story world that sort of define who Zelda is, who Link is, who Ganondorf is, what their relationship to one another is. Um, I th I struggled a lot with how to think about Skyrim and Fallout and Divinity and Disco Elysium, which I've also been playing, because they represent different kinds of sort of hybrid approaches to these things, where the player or the audience member gets some agency in the context of the game, but ultimately they can't deviate too much from the rail system that's been designed. There's only so many quests to do. So you sort of get the best of the open world experience, the best of the Minecraft Lego experience where you can define the story as you want. So my experience playing Fallout 4 is probably very different than most other people's because I didn't do any of the main storyline outside of the very first third of the game. The rest of my experience was defined by me making the characters I wanted to make and making them walk around the world and do stuff. I actually think I have Fallout 4 here on the chart because it's one of the more recent ones, but New Vegas is a better example of this where your, your choices ultimately um, are more meaningful and the characters you create do matter to some extent. I think that's true in a game like Disco Elysium as well, where you're not necessarily creating a traditional Dungeons and Dragons style character that you get to define what they look like and um, their past, but it does allow you to create a mindscape that is defined based on your own thinking about how this particular character behaves in the context of their world. So I threw together a couple of different examples of this. If I could quickly jump in before we go to the next slide. Uh, if you go back to the other slide, I'm surprised that you didn't include games like Planet Coaster or Planet Zero, like Roller Coaster Tycoon, that have sandbox modes that don't really like you could just sit there for 10 hours and if you just wanted to walk around or like even fly around looking at grass and birds and whatever and that could be your entire play style and that could be the story that you form I, I think it's interesting that you didn't include games like that on this list and i was wondering if that was like intentional or or not so i said don't at me about it because i knew that i was going to change my mind about what's going on here um so that is a very good question. Why did I gravitate towards things that I think could probably safely be categorized as mostly RPGs? Like I, I, all of these things, you could put them in that genre or that basket and they would fit more or less comfortably, I think, with other kinds of role playing experiences like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, why did I not put things like Planet Coaster um, or SimCity? I think SimCity is another good one. I thought a lot about that and whether or not SimCity and Planet Coaster and and Games like Flower belong on here. If none of you have played Flower, it is literally a game that I believe is on the PlayStation 2, if I'm not mistaken, in which you float around the world just being a flower petal or a flower seed and a dandelion seed. And, you know, what what is that experience? It is an interactive experience. It is a game. It is art. It is art. Um, uh, where does it fit on this spectrum of well to ill-defined? Well, it's probably towards the ill-defined end or the emergent narrative. And I would put... SimCity and Planet Co uh, the, the the various um, the various simulation style games that are sort of about creating your own world and making meaning of it. I would put them towards the bottom part of this spectrum or the the ill-defined emergent part of it. Um, but again, it depends on what the goal is. So I can imagine an environment or a context in which I am applying that game or applying that experience to a very well-defined or fixed end. So if I'm a teacher having my students play SimCity because I want them to have a particular experience, that's very different than my students participating in SimCity because they wanna make a city that they can destroy with a robot monster from Mars. Like, um, so the, this is why I struggle with how to think about this in general is it, it is not, sing, it, it's not two dimensional. I think that there are actually a bunch of different ways that you can define this. And it's ultimately a matter of how communities of practice organize themselves and define some of these things. So in a vacuum, is this a correct version or interpretation of you know, where each of these things belongs on a spectrum from well-defined to ill-defined? Uh, probably not. It's okay. Like, I, I don't think it matters. Like, because for me, ultimately, it's about the affordances of the different approaches that one could take to design and whether you want those experiences as a designer, you know, this again is the first level of narrative or your authorial intent. If you want those things to be based on the player's projection onto it, or if you think the experience is directed toward a specific idea or theme. So you can't make a version of bio. I, I don't think 
you could make Bioshock as an emergent story. I think it would be exceptionally difficult to do it because it would require uh, the player to find for themselves all the requisite pieces of information baked into that experience to come to the same conclusion that Bioshock directs you to. Um, and, and again, like, I think it's complicated. I don't want to be overly reductivist about this uh, because I think a game like Disco Elysium is a really good example of how complicated this can be. So it's actually a really good segue to jump to my next slide. Um, I put up here three different examples. One of them is Bioshock. So in the bottom left-hand corner, you see Would You Kindly. I'm not going to spoil the game because if you haven't played it, you definitely should play it. Um, and, and I would say Bioshock Infinite is also probably worth playing, although it is problematic in a variety of different ways that I think the first Bioshock was not as problematic. Um, I also have up here a, 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 an image from Fallout New Vegas, where it's with Chris Habersam, who's a scientist slash human who thinks he's a ghoul. So in the Fallout universe, if you've been irradiated, you can become a ghoul and you're essentially a living zombie. Um, he has convinced himself that he is a ghoul, even though he's not one at all. And your entire interaction with him and the subsequent uh, events that take place are dictated by whether or not you tell him the truth about who he is. So in the context of New Vegas, you've made your own character. You get to define who you are. Whereas in a game like Bioshock, you don't get to define who you are. You are the character that's been designed for you. Uh, but in New Vegas, your character can take on these different perspectives that are actually consequential to the world that you operate in and will have effects on other people. So if you, I am going to spoil this quest line because it's just funny and stupid. Um, there is a group of ghouls that live underground in the New Vegas uh, storyline who Chris Haversam works with who believe that if they launch their rockets into space, they will go to the moon. It is sort of loosely based on um, Mormonism and the goal of having your own planet. These ghouls have convinced themselves that that is a literal truth and that if they take these rockets, they will go to space and find their utopia. Um, you can convince Chris Haversam to either do the thing and fix the rockets so they can actually go to space or convince him that these people are lunatics who have been taking advantage of him and then force him the uh, rockets to explode when they go to take off. So you have agency in this context. You are deciding who you want to be and what, what the outcome should be for these other individuals in the context of the game. Similarly, but a little bit different, you have Disco Elysium, which is, an, I put the image on the right-hand side there. Um, in this particular image, my character, who is a uh, highly intellectual individual, but deeply emotionally uh, crippled individual, or at least not very good at reading other people, um, and also not a physically strong individual. So this is a very smart person who's very bad at reading people and also isn't very strong. That changes the ways in which I can affect the world. So similar to how Fallout and Skyrim and these other kinds of open world um, sort of multifaceted uh, dialogue-based games operate sort of like that. Disco Elysium has you pick qualities to yourself that you think matter, but you also don't get to choose everything about who your character is because you can't define their past or their appearance or any of this other stuff. So you're sort of wrapped up in the narrative that's designed for you in a way that's more similar to Bioshock, but has some of the affordances of a game like New Vegas, where you have choice that does meaningfully impact the world in which you operate. Um, one other game that I would note that I did not put on that chart um, or one series of games is Telltale's games. I struggled a lot with that one because it is highly defined and fixed. There are only so many things you can do and ultimately your choices don't matter very much, but they are sort of defined by the story being emergent that you as the player are making these choices and you get to compare your choices with other players. So that's one of those that felt like it was sort of a lateral to some of these things. It was parallel to them, but wasn't on the spectrum in quite the same way. Or maybe I, I put it in the middle with Disco Elysium. Can I jump in on that? Actually, I think I have yeah. like kind of a... So yeah, I was thinking about how like, if you have an ill-defined environment and that environment, you know, then subjectively you say, okay, here are here's my story and here are my goals and here are the things that I want to do. This is what's going on, right? Like, um, if you're playing Animal Crossing and you decide you're a bug enthusiast and you want to catch all the bugs and that's what you want to do and you only accept certain villagers if they like bugs and you're, a, you know, that's your whole character and that's your story and the world that you're living in, right? Um, I suppose, like, sub subjectively, that is well-defined because that is your story and there are worlds that, yeah. And then in, in Telltale games... I suppose the, the, the choices you make in the story that you're forming are based off of this fixed environment, 
but in a way it's sort of it's it's extremely well defined but that's that's subjective to you and the choices you make because yeah like in telltale your choices evidently and ultimately don't matter by the end of the game but uh choice to choice the immediate impact of that choice like do you shoot this person or do you I don't know, choose to feed the little girl or the old lady, right? Like, those mm -hmm. choices that affect immediate uh, storytelling beats, I think, can be subjectively defined in a game that appears to be well-defined, but is actually not very well-defined. I, th I think that Telltale games have all of these micro, ill-defined choice-making experiences that have, that are, that are, immer that are, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is it is not one giant at least I don't think it's one giant fixed experience. I think it's a fixed experience with very small micro emergent experiences in it. I think that's kind of I think that's kind of what I'm thinking it is. So you you're presented with all these choices and you have to determine using the experiences kind of how earlier you were talking about um, how uh, the player like sort of the the agent environment. I think that I think that the environment that you're of a telltale game is the entire thing, but in between those choices, you are in a fixed environment, like a fixed, well-defined environment. Um, and then when you receive those choices, you are put into an ill-defined and emergent environment. And then that, that is changing, and th those choices that you make change based on the entire thing. Yes, and that's a segue to this next slide that I had prepped, which was essentially to argue kind of what you're saying is that Character plus setting equals plot. It doesn't really matter whether the characters and the setting are defined or if the plot is even defined. This is just sort of true. So like if I'm playing Animal Crossing, I get to decide what the character is and how I behave in that space. And the setting is ultimately whatever it is. It's whatever the interactive experience affords. The plot or the narrative or the story that's emergent from my experience is going to be defined by these other things. Like you cannot disaggregate them. So that, that's kind of why I, I would say that as useful as I think a spectrum like this is for at least for the purposes of sort of understanding the, the different kinds of games that exist and how similar or different they are to different games within that same spectrum. Like, I, I think that ultimately the argument is you need to decide what do you want your audience to actually do or experience or get out of the game that you've designed or the story that you've written. And you need to work backward from that, whatever that goal is and decide what is the best way to accomplish that is it going to be to get them to do things the way that they see fit in this context in, a, in a, like a game like animal crossing or in a game like stardew valley or is it better or in the at least in the context of this particular design is it better to structure that in some ways that they cannot move out of so easily that they have to sort of remain on that rail system and again i i want to emphasize as strongly as possible. It's not about good versus bad. Neither of these things is good or bad. It's You can't assess them that way in a vacuum. You have to think about them in the context in which they are being applied by which person for which purpose. Uh, I go again to uh, an example I frequently rely on when I try to dif differentiate games and simulations and play versus fun, that if I'm playing a game like World of Warcraft, it's not necessarily fun if it's assigned to me and it's homework. If I have to play 40 hours of World of Warcraft a week and I work at Blizzard, that might be fun for some people, emotionally experienced that way, but it's not necessarily by default going to be fun or playful or have the other characteristics that we often associate with video games because of the context in which it's being applied. So this is why the situated cognition piece matters a lot, why I care a lot about it is because all of these other things that we do as writers, as authors, as designers, hinge upon the experience that we want to deliver to a particular audience. And that particular audience matters. And my viewpoint, not my viewpoint, but the author's viewpoint of the world matters. Their biases matter because all of that is going to be baked into whatever they create. So again, pointing at Tolkien, he didn't necessarily know or understand all the ways in which his stories could be read as allegory for his religion, for his experience in World War I at the Battle of the Somme. Like all of those things are in there to be understood if the audience takes the time to understand the context, but you have no control over your audience and ultimately have to decide what are the things that I think I can best communicate to them and how can I do that most efficiently in a way that's gonna most adhere to my beliefs 
or philosophy or principles as an author. Uh, and you don't have to have those. Like your, your beliefs can be minimalistic. They don't have to be some, not every story needs to tell a deep truth about humanity and our existence. It doesn't need to trigger existential dread. Like that's kind of my default, but it doesn't have to be everybody's. It's okay to tell happy stories that are just nice. And um, my argument is that that's what Animal Crossing is. That's what Stardew Valley is, that you could do sinister things in those contexts. And many people have, but they're designed around this idea that people can make meaning in a pro-social, um, optimistic, sort of uplifting way, as opposed to you know, giving them something that's very heavy to deal with, either philosophically or emotionally. Um, but there is space for all of those things. And that actually is kind of gets to my last piece, which is about the practical application of all of this. Or why did I just spend the last, I don't know, 45 minutes uh, talking at all of you about all of these things? Why do I think it's worth your time to think about them? Um, in my own job as a university faculty member, I have to think a lot about how do I design things? Why do I design them? That I don't get the luxury of not reflecting on stuff because, well, I guess I could do that, but then I wouldn't be a very good scholar or teacher or all of, I, I wouldn't be fulfilling the responsibilities that I think I have to being a member of, of, to being a public scholar, to being somebody who's supposed to create knowledge for the good of humanity. So I think a lot about what I do in the context of the practical application and what it means to tell stories in a meaningful and pro-social way. So. I think a lot about the Addy model of instructional design, which is this very brief, I'm going to go over this very briefly. Um, it's the analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate cycle. You'll notice that in this cycle, evaluate is at the center because it's not a last thing that's done. It's something that's done continuously. So when you're an author, you're always thinking about who is my audience? Are they getting the message I want them to get? How can I get better, get orient them so that they're able to uh, understand what I want them to understand? Again, going back to that tuning attention and intention. Um, and as you analyze and design and develop, and then finally implement this thing that you've created, whether, and again, this applies to stories, it applies to classroom instruction, it applies to games that you're designing. All of these spaces have the need to think about how and why they teach and talk about stories the way they do. I'm encouraging you to think strategically throughout this process and evaluate throughout this process all of the different facets and constituencies that are affected by it and how long-term the uh, narrative or the idea that you've associated with your work is going to be interpreted, could be interpreted, and then um, cre either foster a community of practice around it, so a pro-social community of practice that you help start or you help create, or be prepared to defend against different kinds of misinterpretations or misapplications of your work. Um, I, I know you had mentioned earlier, Josh, the uh, the, the Wachowskis and the notion of red pilling, right? The, the Wachowski, Wachowskis are an extremely interesting example because they are individuals who did not explicitly write the Matrix as a trans narrative, but openly say that it is a trans narrative now in retrospect, knowing who they are as people based on their own reflections on their own identities, that they didn't write the Matrix to be trans, but by virtue of who they were and the life worlds they had experienced and the uh, different ideas that they brought to the table, including their own identity, how they understood themselves, all of that was infused into the story that they told. So like Tolkien, uh, the allegory didn't need to be explicit. It didn't have to be there for the artist to say, hey, look, here's all the arrows pointing at the thing I wanted you to do and like beating you over the head with it. People were able to project onto that work their own experiences, trans individuals, and then be able to convince or at least communicate with or dialogue with the author. Because I think authorship is bi-directional, that it's the audience talking to the author and the author talking to the audience. Like they inform one another. And um, the, the Matrix is a case where it wasn't consciously a work about transness in the same way that uh, Lord of the Rings wasn't consciously a work about Catholicism, but those two things um, emerged by virtue of who the author was and how they designed their work. Now, in the context of what you're doing um, as, as teachers, as designers, as um, authors, you don't have to think necessarily about writing a story that defines transness or defines what it was like to be in World War I and to be a person who believes in divine intervention. Like, you don't have to uh, do all that sort of heavy stuff, but I do encourage you to, as you're designing, think about this process and revise uh, 
constantly based on how you reevaluate and think about your audience and yourself and um, have conversations with your past self about what it is you're actually trying to accomplish. And one way to do that, and again, I've, I've kind of broken it up in different categories, depending on what it is that you're trying to organize, but they all have the same basic framework, this idea that you create a thing and that thing is broken down into subcategories or sub levels. So if it's a, if it's for educational purposes, I would have a whole course and that course has an objective that's then broken into units and each unit has an objective and those less the each unit is broken into lessons and lessons into activities and all of those things feed up into one another. So imagine a giant pyramid. This is like the good kind. I don't want to say there's such a thing as a good pyramid scheme, but like if you're going to think of a pyramid, this is a good kind of pyramid. Not like the food pyramid, which also is like bogus science. Don't follow the food pyramid, at least not the old one. Um when you're creating the thing you're creating, think of this like a pyramid where your objectives are aligned uh from top to bottom and they sort of uh, get broader as the entire thing goes closer down to the bottom. Um, if you're making a film, that means thinking about your movie's theme and then breaking it into acts and how those acts are structured based on scenes. And then those scenes being designated into different beats of a story that communicate different ideas or feelings. I there's a really great video by Sage Hayden Hayden uh, of Just Right, uh, a video essay about Death Note, the anime Death Note. He talks about this idea in the context of story beats and how that particular narrative is told in a particular way that suits it very well for the kinds of messages it wants to communicate and how it creates tension. Um, and in the context of things like games or books, you're talking about looking at the whole uh, game or text level and then breaking it down into chapters, levels, puzzles, phrases, etc. So if you've read anything that I've said, uh, written before, or heard me talk before, you've heard me mention this one-to-one -one alignment of game and learning objectives. Um, that's the thing that makes transfer happen. That's what makes the time for telling possible. That's what makes it uh, so important for designers and authors and educators to think about the relationships between the thing you're asking your audience to do or think about and the thing you want them to go out into the world and do. You have to give them the correct tools and case studies or generator sets that are going to provoke them to go do the things you want them to do in the way you want them to do them, hopefully for pro-social reasons, things that are going to be beneficial to themselves and the community as a whole. Um, okay, So this is just, again, sort of a, a visual that accompanies the, the last slide about how you can break these things down. It's an organizational framework. I really, really recommend doing this when you're working on a project to keep track of how do your themes align with one another? Um, how do they integrate with one another? Uh, and lastly, I wanted to show you some worked examples of this. So it's not just me talking about these abstract concepts of, of writing stories or thinking about how you organize them, but instead showing you how this actually applies in environments that aren't even necessarily explicitly about fiction, right? It can be nonfiction environments in which you are telling a story about somebody's experience or the experience they might have. So this is a, uh, a screenshot from the Yukon EdTech website. And on that website, we uh, provide to the people who are applying to the Educational Technology Master's program uh, a breakdown of essentially all of the artifacts that they create in the context of the program, and then what initiatives those individual artifacts fulfill. So at the bottom, you can see there's a denotation for content, pedagogy, or disposition-based skills. So if you're an educator or you're working in the realm of educational technology, um, we care a lot about how those three different categories shake out, that we want people to be uh, competent with their content area, or in this case, technology, competent with how they instruct people, how they think about teaching, and then finally, competent in their disposition or how they present that information, how they think about it, what frameworks they use with it. So we try to create a narrative based on these objectives that is then oriented along a chronological scale or time span in which individuals will do these artifacts. It's the same thing as a game. Uh, in fact, we actually have a name for the game that accompanies this program called Project Technologia, which is all about learning how to be a, per, uh, uh, a prominent user of technology within your community and help other people become better at using it as well. Um, we, we, there's another way to think about this. This is called a crosswalk, and it shows the different objectives associated with the program broken down by the different artifacts or experiences that a learner would have in the program. And again, this is oriented toward education, but it is also relevant for writing a story. It is relevant for 
creating a game, you want to be thinking about how does each chapter, each experience, each assessment or evaluation in the context of my design achieve the goals that are associated with it. So the goals that are here are actually drawn from this thing called the ISTE standards, which is an international set of standards for educators, students, tech coaches, and others who work in education. Um, so that they can have sort of a consistent practice of technology for themselves. But there are other ways you can think about this too. So if I were a language educator, I might use the world readiness standards for learning. These are called the five C's. Uh, that includes communication, cultures, connections, comparisons, and communities. And those might be the basis for writing my story. So if I were going to, for instance, go back to my diagram here with the broken down uh, chart of my course level objectives to my unit objectives to lesson and activity, I could align my objectives in such a way that it would tell a cohesive beginning, middle, and end story of what it was to be a person who learned about this particular thing, uh, whether that's science, whether that's about aliens and Mass Effect and doing the right thing or the wrong thing in the context of Mass Effect. Uh, it could be how Fable is broken into the game Fable uh, is broken into chapters and then you complete those chapters and how you choose to complete those things affects the kind of character you become. Um, so there are different affordances for different approaches uh, to doing storytelling. And generally speaking, as long as you know what your themes or objectives are, that's going to help you think about what it is you want to actually accomplish and how you're going to orient your user, your audience to do that, whether it's going to be something that's a fixed narrative experience, an emergent narrative experience, or something in between. Uh, right here, you see a couple of images. One of them is the, the Dodd Center at Yukon Stores campus. The other is of courtroom 600 at Nuremberg, the actual courtroom where the war trials, the tribunals took place after World War II. So I work on a project called Courtroom 600, which is about the history and legacies of the Holocaust. And the reason why we do this at UConn is partly because UConn has papers from the Nuremberg trials belonging to Thomas Dodd, who is a former senator. He was one of the lead prosecutors at Nuremberg. And uh, we, we have access to sort of his internal thoughts, like the things that he wrote down, the notes he took, the letters he wrote. Uh, we also have access to the transcripts of the trial and artifacts from the trial that were presented as evidence. So what we wanted to do was think about having all of this material in the archive put online so that anyone anywhere could access it and then give them a reason to want to investigate an archive, to go think about some of these hard, difficult, uh, challenging, and, and when I say that, I mean emotionally and in terms of content, um, experiences from the past in the context of information learned since the trial took place. So adding in voices of individuals who whose memories were not recorded at the trial or who stories were not learned of until after the trial. Essentially, we wanted to create a narrative or cobble together a space in which individuals could interrogate these in a mean, these documents, these artifacts in a meaningful way in a context in which they actually applied so that they could better understand them for their own lives. And I, I take a lot of pride in working on this project. I'm very happy to work on this project because I think it's important because I think creating virtual experiences that communicate big ideas is not impossible. And I don't think it needs to be for profit. Like I, going back to the example earlier of Call of Duty, we can talk about the complexity and nuance of something like World War II and the Holocaust because we're not trying to sell as many copies of this thing as possible. We're trying to give an honest accounting of what actually took place and help individuals understand how history itself can sort of be a story that we tell to communicate important ideas. I actually did a really great conversation last night with Nuri Sharif, who's a public historian talking exactly about this issue. So if you're interested in that, I can pass along a link. Um, beyond that though, we can do things that are useful for educators. So here you see a couple of images taken from uh, a work in progress called AOS 503, which some of you are actually working on. And this experience is partly about teaching teachers learning science or learning theory. It's also partly experimental in the sense that we're trying to understand how do we strike the right balance between fixed versus emergent narrative. So the goal of this project, unlike Courtroom 600, which is virtual reality and an oriented towards exploring individual artifacts, AOS 503 is oriented towards dialogue. It's oriented towards convincing or persuading individuals to take on a particular perspective. And in order to convince them to take on the ideas that you have as a tech coordinator in this space station uh, in which we've set the story, 
uh, you essentially have to figure out what do they believe in and how do I convince them based on their own beliefs to adopt a specific set of principles, which is probably more in line with how we actually convince people than just didactically telling them stuff. Uh, you have to get people to be emotionally invested. And one of the reasons why we think this is a good striking of the balance between sort of the emergent versus the fixed storyline is it gives people the opportunity to explore the space and make sense of the environment the way they want to and uh, reply with the kinds of comments they want to use. And then towards the latter half of the game that's, as it's being developed, they'll have an opportunity to spend the currency they've accumulated in the form of influence with different individuals within the space station to affect different kinds of changes. So by allowing people the opportunity to make decisions they want to make them, there will be lived consequences within this space that they can then go back and replay through to get a sense of how does me making different kinds of decisions affect the outcomes of those decisions. And in this context, that's very important because we want teachers to transfer those skills out of the game and into their own teaching and learning environments in a school district. So that means um, practicing the skill of talking to your colleagues or your peers, and then applying the influence that you sort of accumulate by working with them towards uh, finishing certain kinds of projects that are relevant to you or interesting to you, or that you think will help your, your school district. Um, that can only happen if we tell a story that gets buy-in from the individual, that they can tell the story the way they want to tell it. And there are clear connections to the actual lived experience they have as teachers so that when they go back out into the world, there is an immediate transfer space for the information they've uh, sort of played around with in the virtual sandbox that we create for them. So that is the end of my official presentation. I apologize for going so long. I appreciate you jumping in a couple of times, Josh. And I wanted to, I'll stop sharing my screen in a moment just to kind of chat about these issues, but I'd like to hear more from all of you, the questions you have, the things you've been thinking about as I talked about some of these things and how some of these ideas might apply to your own work. So, Typically, before we go into questions, we do this thing at the end of every single uh, every single presentation where everybody unmutes their mics and claps egregiously loud, and then we go to questions. So if everybody could just quickly unmute their mic <laughs> for me um, and just start clapping, like, now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It was a really, really great presentation. It was a good discussion. Um, a lot of really interesting things. Um, yeah, um, I have a few questions, but if anybody has any questions, you can jump in before me. Um, mine are more like what iffy and explorative based on the stuff that we looked at. But yeah, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to everybody if anybody has any specific things. Also fine with people meditating on some of this for a moment. So like, it's cool to collect your thoughts. I have nowhere I have to be. It's fine. Yeah, I suppose my main... One thing that I was thinking about is like, it's very easy to think about how you employ a fixed narrative, right? Like, you, you know, you, you look at you could say, like, this is a story, and these are the parts of the story, but for an emergent narrative, it's much, it's much more difficult to give, I suppose you, I suppose, like, it's just giving the player tools to interact with a game world, and then letting the players figure out how they want to use those tools, but I'm, I'm starting to sort of wonder, are aspects of that world indicative or influential in how they go about that process like in minecraft if if the game i don't know if the game had uh like way more animals would people focus on that much more than other aspects of the game right like are there is there is there a secret combination of elements that creates environments that players want to explore and create their own narratives or is it as simple as here's a bunch of stuff that lets you interact with a virtual environment like uh 
I know when I was a kid, there was that program. It was like it was like a Lego creation program, and you could download it and play and like build things out of virtual Lego, and then you could order that order those parts from their website. But I never did because it was stupidly expensive. But I know that when I was a kid, I would just build a bunch of really cool robots. And I played Spore a lot, and I didn't actually play Spore and run around. I just made stuff in the Creator, and to me that was really cool because it was like three D three D modeling and creation, but I never really thought about it as my own story, right? I thought of it as like I am the master of this very small domain, <laughs> like so. But yeah, I want to know your thoughts on that and kind of where that yeah. Leads. So I, to the to the last thing you said, I think you actually are. All of us are sort of the master of our own story, and that it's not that you're. I, I think that this is a, a an academic kind of conversation to have. I like, let me back up a little bit. I don't think this actually practically matters for all intents and purposes when it comes to like kids playing video games, kids playing Minecraft, like unless there is a specific reason that you're trying to get them or moving toward a particular goal. I don't think you have to worry much about whether or not they attend to certain things in the environment, unless it's pertinent to the goal that you have for the game's design. So uh, I think about this with respect to Stardew Valley, as I've been playing it, is my attention has been on fishing and foraging in addition to trying to get as far as I can in the mines. I haven't paid any real attention to my farm at all, other than planting enough things to be able to you know, get the gifts at the end of the, the year or whatever. So I, I, I think ultimately this is a question that comes down to if you as the author care about whether or not everybody participating in the thing you've created will have a will have the experience you want them to have that there's a one specific experience you want them to have in mind or i guess in the case of very broad broad games like skyrim or uh, divinity or disco elysium like in those contexts you just have to be okay with knowing that many players will never see most of the content you created that it's it's okay that they only saw 10% of the entire content like so disco elysium i believe has something like a million words which is equivalent to 10 novels and unless you play the game over and over and over again you're not going to see most of that text and voice recording and voice acting that you probably won't see quest lines that's obviously true of things like skyrim and fallout as well which are highly dependent on whether or not you individually want to go engage with the things that are interesting on the map i think one of game that's super interesting in this regard is breath of the wild because most of the most of what makes breath of wild breath of the wild interesting isn't the narrative and it's not the mechanics or even really the systems that are in the game it's that it is designed to draw your attention to things that are in the distance that you want to go explore and then the distances between those are very very big so there's a lot of things to find along the way so really what you're talking about i think is sort of where does player agency and inquiry end and authorial intent begin? Like, is that something that authors really, is it something that authors can have control over? Um, and, and if I'm misrep misrepresenting your question, please let me know. I, no, yeah, I think that's, I'm... That's, that's pretty much it. Like, like, as a game designer, if I wanted to cultivate an environment that, you know, players would be a part of, and then let's say I have 10 people and I'll put them, I put them in this environment and I just want to see what they come up with what what do you think what aspects specifically of that game trigger the the parts in our brain that say i want to i want to make up my own story and build this narrative and this is the world that i'm in uh you're gonna hate my answer but it's it depends <laughs> like nice it, I, of course, well, I mean of course so it does like 50 percent of the time my answer is it depends 50 percent of my time the time my answer is it's situated which also just means it depends like it so the it's it really, really comes down to why are you making this thing to begin with? Like, are you making it just to exist? Are you making it to be interpreted? Are you making it because you want to tell that story in a particular way? And then it once you have identified that goal, it becomes possible to figure out, okay, then what are the next steps I have to take in order to shape player behavior? So earlier I have the slide that says, um, talks about intention and attention. Education is or sorry, learning is just the education of intention and attention. Um, in order to interact as individuals in the environment, to perceive and act on the things around us, and again, this goes back to agent environment interaction, um, we have to have our perception tuned. And what that means is for all of you to learn something and be able to apply it somewhere else, 
you have to have your attention drawn to it. Somebody has to point to it and be like, hey, look at this thing. And it doesn't, I should take that back. It's not even somebody individually, another person who has to point at the thing. You have to find meaning in the connection between things, the interaction between them in order to then uh, identify affordances of those things and use them to solve some problem. Now, I've used the word affordance a lot of times. I didn't define that at all. Affordances are not things that just are just properties of the environment. Like they don't, they're not there part of a rock. Like a rock has many affordances, but the rock's affordances are not just part of the rock. Affordances are the things that we as agents in the environment or as individuals identify about things around us and that we then act on in the environment in order to solve some goal or achieve some end or, or uh, get to some goal. So for instance, I have a full can of uh, polar dry seltzer here. And this has many affordances, one of which is if I were to open it, I could drink the content inside and be have my thirst quenched. But it also has affordances like I could throw it at someone and it would probably hurt if I hit them hard enough. Not that I'm advocating anyone throw this fine beverage at anyone. But um, and there are other affordances, too. So if I scraped the uh, the, the it's not paint, but if I if I got the. Uh, material off the outside of this to get rid of the image it's on it and just aluminum aluminum can I could repurpose the can and put something else in it and label it differently or I could melt down the aluminum and turn it into some other object that you know has these other properties so um, when I'm talking about affordances in design and in storytelling essentially what I'm saying is create affordances create opportunities for action in the environment that you make and those opportunities for action should reflect the things you want the player to ultimately do and the player, by virtue of exploring the environment and inquiry of, in a, of their own, will be able to figure out different things they can do in that space. And I think Animal Crossing is a great example of that, where people have found workarounds to put in the kinds of fabrics or patterns they want and to share with one another different clothes that has stuff on it. And um, you can apply that context for all different kinds of purposes. So, for instance, I remember um, this is. There are two examples that come to mind where games have been applied in this way. One of them was Pokemon Go to the Polls, and one of them was um, last election where there was, uh, I know of uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, uh, Animal Crossing Island. I do not know off the top of my head if there was a Trump Island, and if there was one, I don't know what was on it. But um, those are examples of applying a game space for a particular goal. I mean, irrespective of partisan politics, like the use of a thing like Animal Crossing to... Uh, get constituents or potential voters into a space to learn about your campaign. All of that is uh, a goal that can be shaped in the context of Animal Crossing because Animal Crossing comes equipped with the affordances that allow for that action. So that's a really wordy way to answer your question, but uh, figuring out what those things are is only the only way to achieve what you're talking about. And to do that, you have to do a robust needs analysis when you start your project. I think I've, I think, I think, by getting that answer, I have confused myself further. I understand it all, but I think that now I'm thinking about how Halo 3, I guess also like all the Halo, a lot of the Halo games have like the Forge mode that was added by the designers to have people do what they want. But you can put rules into Forge mode and make things like hockey, or you can make things like Griffball and all these, all these things that are semi-programmed by the users to create new game modes out of the game modes that are already in that game. And it is... You know, what I, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, the designers themselves didn't have any real intent. They didn't put Forge Mode in and say, go make a race with all the warthogs driving around, right? I, I think I think the, the part where I'm, where I'm kind of questioning, and I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really saying right or wrong or that I feel like I'm lost, but more so where I'm thinking is, like, where does a game like Dwarf Fortress come in? Like, the player chooses to sit down and have it generate this world with all these parameters that they themselves define. Why is the player doing that, right? I guess I guess it comes down, I guess you're absolutely right that it comes down to subjectivity and specifics of who is playing and what they're doing, and I think that's really cool. <laughs> Let me give you another quick example, although I think we actually touched on this a little bit earlier as well, but... What you're talking about is, again, that third level of narrative. How are our communities of practice cropping up around a particular game and then creating a narrative of their own that is potentially completely unrelated? So I use the example in one of my chapters that I've written about World of Warcraft, where I can participate in a guild and I have stories about my participation in the guild 
but the things the guild does can then cause other things to happen that are unrelated to World of Warcraft. So like personal drama or interpersonal drama between members of the guild, there's some sort of love triangle or something like, or, or forum uh, arguments where people are fighting with one another, which causes that to bleed over into real world spaces where maybe they're friends in real life. Like those are all examples of how game spaces and narrative spaces can have a follow on effects. And that's, one of the reasons why I, I try to harp so much on this is because it's really easy to think that whatever your little piece of reality is that you've created, like that's going out into the world and whatever it is, is whatever you intended it to be, but it's not actually the way that humans interact with things. And um, like, I go back to designs that I've done before and I'm disappointed with not having done something that I would have done now. Um, I think about how different audiences, I, the design work I've done, um, reach different audiences if I had done different kinds of things to make it more appealing in particular kinds of ways. So I, I think Fortnite is kind of a good example too of like people making meaning, uh, like they have the Tomato Town song that got really popular on TikTok. Uh, that is an example of the community coming around a designed thing to find their own meaning in it. Um, another really good example of this is Dota actually, and then League of Legends, which is the result of this uh, genre that emerged by virtue of the level creation tool in Warcraft 3. Like all of these things are interconnected to one another by virtue of how the design community or the player-based community, the audience organized itself around the original tool that had affordances for creation. And I think this is actually really important uh, now more so than ever because the it's sort of new still that individuals have the ability to publish their own content on these platforms. So Roblox and Dota, I think was an example of this with respect to Warcraft 3, that there are now just games that exist where there is a narrative associated with them, but there is also content created by players. Minecraft obviously falls into this category too, or any game that has mods. There are tons of games that have mods that fit in this category. So Skyrim and Fallout and all of those also are, are in this basket. Um, so you are a prosumer of games if you play them. You are both somebody who plays, a, well, you can be a prosumer of games if you're somebody who plays them. You can be somebody who consumes the content that was written for you and interpret that based on your own life world, or you can be a producer in that environment and then affect the community in which you're operating, which is really interesting because now you have individuals within the broader community who are able to affect the, the points of centrality within that community, the original designer, the person who authored that work, and that affects the way that the work is then interpreted. So it becomes this sort of, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole organism, the whole super way that meta. it interacts. That's extremely meta. <laughs> yeah, it, I, it, I, I mean, it though. is. So I, I can toss up some other slides really quickly. Um, these probably will make no sense, um, but I will put them up and just sort of describe them to you briefly because it's related to what we're talking about. Um, one of the graduate students I work with is finishing his dissertation on esports, and we've talked a lot about communities of practice. And so what you're looking at in, you can see that my PowerPoint, right? Um, what we're looking at here is um, a point in a three-dimensional space. So that that black colored dot in the middle of that 3D graph um, is surrounded by three bubbles. And those bubbles represent communities that that individual person belongs to. So um, they are, for all intents and purposes, the center of attention for measuring this. But at time point one and two and three and four, which are those four uh, vertical extensions of those bubbles, the communities themselves change their shape and the dynamics by which they interact. They change the ways that they overlap with one another. So say this person belongs to a community, a, a guild in World of Warcraft. Um, they belong to the modding community and they belong to the, um, let's say they belong to the, the, a costuming organization, a, a group of costumers, right? So those three communities would be distinct from one another, but they are also related to one another. And there are probably individuals in those communities who do also, like this individual we're looking at, move between them. So when I'm kind of describing this, this meta-ness of, of design or this meta-ness of thinking about how individuals interact with materials, it, 
this is probably not the way most humans should pro think about this. Like this is overly complicated for, I think what the work most people do, but if you're really interested in thinking through the, the way that this happens, think about all the ways that your product, your piece of art, your design becomes its own community of practice for individuals who participate in that community. And that you, as well as everybody else in that community, represents a point within that community as a sphere. So these, I realize these look like circles. Imagine them as being spherical, like basketballs or something else floating in 3D space, but also with the property of being able to intersect with one another. So more like bubbles or nesting dolls. Um, it, one individual will exist simultaneously in all of these spaces, and they will move in orientation around that individual, depending on what that individual's goals are. So if you were to sort of extrapolate this to multiple interpretations of different kinds of variables, depending on what you cared about as the person measuring all of this, like, and again, like this is stuff that no one is measuring all of this about everyone all the time. Although smartphone technologies and other forms of technology are making it more and more possible to collect essentially infinite data about people. Um, I, ultimately what I'm trying to say here is that there are different ways that you can interpret these communities of practice that bubble up around people and the ways they interact with them at different points in time. So all of this exists on a space-time continuum. If you were to sort of map this out, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those graphs like from um, his, Stephen Hawking's book, The History, A Brief History of Time, but space-time, if where there's a high point of gravity, like a sun or this huge mass in space, will have a big dip in it where it, it affects the way that time interacts with space. And you can think of these communities as being kind of similar, where these the more central you are to those communities, the more tightly knit you are to that community, the more important you are within that community, the greater the gravitational pull it would have, the more effect it would have on your goals and your perspective and the way you understand the world. So over time, these communities that you're a part of, these, these things that you're doing within a particular community are going to change that sometimes you'll be really invested and it'll be really important to you and it'll be a really small community but sometimes it'll get bigger and sometimes it'll be less important to you and ultimately it ends up creating this thing that because i can't draw this effectively in powerpoint is a braid like imagine braided hair like somebody actually took these different strands and wove them together and sometimes they're thicker or thinner and they interact and disrespect in different ways but essentially that's what you're creating when you create a game is a create community of practice that people operate within and then interact with one another to propagate whatever the idea was that you initiated. So when I say that it's, I, I go back to the Uncle Ben quote from Spider-Man all the time, with great power comes great responsibility. If you're creating this kind of artwork that could potentially affect the way that other people think and behave, it is incumbent upon you to think about all the different communities that intersect with you, the one that you're trying to create for, and to anticipate that there will be ones that you can't possibly conceive of because you are limited in your own experience set. So you're gonna have to be open to the idea that these communities will expand and contract and change their size and shape and scope over time, um, which is sort of like way bigger and beyond the scope of just game design, but more sort of how communities in general just work. That's true of political entities, economic entities, religious entities, scientific endeavors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That Welcome answer. That very unsolicited philo philosophical yeah. explanation. That, 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 um, that, yeah, I think, uh, I think that was a pretty intense answer. When you, when you pulled up space time and how that relates to it, I was like, there's no way that this is just going to make sense. And then of course it did. Cause it's, of course it can. Well, I like to think it did. I don't no, know. No, it, it makes sense. It actually makes a lot of sense. The visualization, uh, if you if you guys had, had if you guys didn't understand what uh, professor was talking about um, with how you know that gravitation stuff works, Bryant puts a uh, a small infograph or info picture, I guess, just of how that is. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a really fantastic uh, walkthrough of that thought process. Um, we do have five left, five minutes left, so I will. Uh, just kind of pass this to whoever is interested or has a question to ask as well. Don't be shy. Obviously, I like hearing myself talk, so it doesn't matter if you have questions or not. I'm happy <laughs> to answer them. 
haven't had a chance to look at whatever was in the chat. So that was news to me that people had been kind of like annotating as I was going along. So I'll take a look at that afterward as well. There's a there's a few things. I think it's I think um, I was also peeking here and there, um, but yeah, I also uh, I'm, I'm learning about pyramid schemes. Throwing cans at people like this—that shouldn't be the take. Takeaway should not be to harm <laughs> other people or to start pyramid schemes. Those are not the takeaways from this presentation. So, if I had to pick <laughs> one unifying theme, it would be that notion that uh, character plus setting equals plot, and that you really need to think about what is the story you're telling when you're interacting with people, and what could their takeaways potentially be you don't necessarily anticipate. Yeah. I think as well, like, just the whole character plus setting equals plot thing was always fun to me because, like, I always think about the setting as its own character. And I, th I think everybody should. Like, I think, I mean, in the most literal sense, you have stories like uh, like that game Bowser's Inside Story, where Bowser mm -hmm. is the environment and the character. And I think that's, I think that makes it more interesting. Like, I think, like, um, oh, man, I'm blanking on what it's called um it's a it's that game where everything is a pixel every single every single oh man whatever it, oh, yeah? It, yeah super Another mario no, thank you zach <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm thinking of noida where like the environment changes and dictates every yeah so I, th I think i think that the environment is a story and as a as a character um i think is way more interesting than if it's this this thing that never changes like i think I, I guess like I guess in in I'm trying to think of a good example for this, but I suppose like I I, I want to say f like Fallout 3's wasteland barely changes mm. even after you do things that should really change it. I mean Fallout 4 even right like the endings of Fallout 4, which I am more familiar with, they, none of them really make a big change. Like in in the most extreme case you can't access an area and where that area is there is a giant crater and that's it the, the characters don't really talk about it the world doesn't change nothing changes and i think that's really boring i think that it'd be way more interesting especially in a game like fallout like imagine if you could conjure an army or not even conjure i guess like organize and run an army kind of like how in shadow of mordor you can but instead of just having these battles and you know small interactions with enemies they were on this grand scale where different environments opened up and you could have these different open world experiences inside these smaller pockets of the world that only form yeah. because you destroyed a city and now that you've destroyed this post-apocalyptic city a bunch of bandits have moved in but because of that a bunch of people are now defending their destroyed homes and you have this whole new dynamic that was once not well, even there there's there was a an interview with will wright that i listened to a few days ago that actually touched on something quite relevant to this, which is when Maxis started, when SimCity was SimCity 2000 was a thing, um, the goal originally was to create a series of games in which you could inhabit the body of an individual Sim and then expand out. They actually did do this at one point, but now it's, it's not quite the same. Um, you could embody one Sim, go experience your city as a Sim, and then zoom back out going into SimCity and then manipulate the different parts of the town, the residential, the commercial, the industrial, et cetera. So what they really wanted to do was create this dynamic environment where you're controlling multiple levels at the same time of these complex systems and able to see firsthand what it's like to exist in that space. And I think ultimately that's a cool strategy. I think multiple, I think games would do well to adopt if it weren't they weren't patented. I would say games would do well to ado adopt the Nemesis system from Warner Brothers Shadow of Mordor, which I should have also put on my chart, my spectrum chart, um, because it's a really good example of how emergent stories can be interesting. You just have to create complex systems that are randomized in a way that are uh, not so common that it feels like everybody's experience is randomized the same way. Um, and that the interactions that you have with those randomized elements then become the core of the story you're telling. It's not really about the randomized thing. It's not about Grog the Impaler or whatever the name is of the orc. It's, it's more about you as the player or the audience member remembering and having good emotions associated with the experience or, or bad emotions, I guess, depending on what happened with Grog. Uh, 
the, the, you're going to associate the experience with Grog with the story that you would then tell somebody else about it. And that story sort of defines everything about your interaction with that game. And um, it, again, it, like, it depends on what you want. Shadow of Mordor is not intended to tell any deep philosophical story. I think the actual narrative embedded in it is quite weak and that Tolkien would have been quite upset about it. Uh, but the Nemesis system is really cool. And I'm really excited to see how people do similar things. Like what does Stardew Valley look like if there are some elements that are randomized and some elements that are not? What is a game like, um, what is the next iteration of a game like Disco Elysium look like when we have some other ideas about how to start a narrative beyond amnesia to have our character develop? Um, yeah. There are a lot of interesting questions in, in the realm of design that haven't been tackled yet. And that's kind of what I'm hopeful all of you will go do yeah, um, I, I do have to run in a moment. But the final thought that I have, um, talking about randomized elements, I can't think of. I can't not think of roguelikes. Um, mm. I think I think that one example, and I do have to run in like thirty seconds. But in Hades, um, this is a spoiler. So anybody who doesn't want to hear the spoiler about Hades, um, it's it's a very late spoiler. It's going to take you roughly like one hundred to one hundred and twenty hours to actually achieve this, but. If you successfully romance and completely finish off, I see people muting it. If you complete, if you completely finish both uh, the the story tracks for uh, Megara and her sisters, uh, including the pa the Pact of Punishment thing and whatever, and then you also um, completely um, you completely finish Thanatos's series of people are unmuting it. Oh, no. If you completely finish basically both of everything that they have to do, you can have you can have an encounter where they're both in your bedroom when you come back, and you can choose to join them in the bed. And then, of course, it's like it's like the it's like the individual sex scenes that happen where it's like dark and there's sound effects. But where I'm going with this is that you can also choose not to. And I think that I think that that feels to me like I remember when I saw that happen, I was like, that is way more than I thought was in this game. I didn't know that was even a possibility. And I, I personally think it's kind of funny that it's in there. You know what I mean? And to me, that, that feels individualized enough that I've been playing that game for long enough that I'm like, wow, that's in there. There's no way. You know, it feels like that it's something unique that I've discovered. And I think that's ultimately what this kind of loops back to, you know? But I, I mean, it comes it comes down to discovery and how valuable that discovery will be in getting the audience to attend to the things you want them to attend to. So if we had to, if we're ending, I'd say that's a good note to end on. Yeah. Is that you can think about your audience and what your goals are, and make sure those things are always at the forefront of whatever it is you're trying to write, and then decide what are the affordances of the different kinds of versus a narr uh, emergent narrative that are best suited for my context. Cool. If anybody else has any questions, I'm sure uh, Professor Sloat is going to be reading the general chat. I have to run. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. I, this was really fantastic. Thank you, Professor, for, for taking time out of your, your day to come and hang out with us and give this presentation. Um, thank you for enjoy. I enjoyed being here. Thank you for inviting me. And I hope uh, if any of you have follow-up questions, you can email me or uh, reach out and I would be happy to talk to you. Awesome. All right, cool. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'll be posting this on YouTube, hopefully later today. Um, and then, Professor, if you're comfortable, we can also share the slides uh, in the Meeting Notes channel as well. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that about concludes it. Thank you all uh, very much.